thank you. So good morning, everyone. Um, let me start with a bit of review of what we did yesterday, very briefly. And for that, let me share my screen. Oh, and I should say we already have some of the recordings of yesterday uh, online, and you find the information and the link on the Indico page, and we'll send out an email uh, as well later. Okay, so first we started on uh, with Bayesian inference and um, discussed a bunch of concepts. And one of them is that we want to get probability distributions on some parameter of interest. And we showed how we can do that with grids um, in very low dimensional problems. So here one dimensional. And we can use these probability distributions we discussed various ways to find intervals where most of the probability is, for example, where 90% of the probability is. And that's very useful for science. And we were thinking about various, uh, or we are thinking about various tools to get there to these probability distribution. And one procedure we looked at yesterday was important sampling. Um, which sort of uses this biased proposal, which it then corrects for. And this is a slightly more efficient way to also get these probability distributions on one parameter and the other parameter. Um, but um, this method, if you try it out, it will work uh, better than grids. But if you go to 5, 10, 20 dimension, it will. Um, be very inefficient as well. And today we will talk about a different method which scales quite nicely with the number of parameters. And that uh, family of methods is called Markov chain Monte Carlo. So let me start with that. So we are starting again with our toy likelihood, our, our banana in this parameter space. And let's start thinking about Markov chain Monte Carlo. <clears throat> so before we had important sampling and we draw a bunch of points and they didn't have any relationship to each other. They were uncorrelated. And now we will do something different where these points have some relation to each other, where they are correlated. So let me introduce first a bunch of uh, terminology that is important for, for this uh, method. So we will develop an algorithm which produces a sequence of points. So these points have a sequence to them. You first get a point theta one, and that can be a parameter vector. So you set alpha to three and beta to two, and that would be your theta one. And then you draw a new point, a new parameter set, theta two, and so forth and so forth. And finally, you have the last one, theta n. And this sequence of points is called a chain. And uh, there are a special type of chain where the sequence of points of the uh, there's a special type of chain where the next point only depends on the immediately previous point. So theta two depends only on theta one and theta three depends only on theta two, but not on theta one. And if that's the case, if you only depend on the, just the previous one, then we can say the chain has a Markov property and you, we can call this chain a Markov chain. Markov was a Russian mathematician who developed much of the theory uh, in the 90s, specifically the 1890s. So you see this is a very uh, well-studied um, uh, old field, but with the advent of uh, computers, this really has taken off. So what can we do with these Markov chains? So here you see a visualization, you start somewhere in your parameter space, then you make a transition and you have a new point, and again, you have a transition and you have a new point, this whole thing is called a chain. And you see 
the transition only links the previous points to the next one. But this one doesn't get at least not directly information about theta zero. Okay, so if we get three of those points in our parameter space, so three dots in our three dots in our plane, these three points will not approximate our posterior distribution yet. I mean, this is not enough information to really characterize complex distributions, right? So when can we say that all of these points, if we make a histogram, for example, that they really approximate the posterior that we are interested in? So here are some technical terms. If the distribution of these chain points really does approximate the target distribution, we can call this chain converged. It converged to the target. And uh, this may require running this chain for thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even billions of iterations. And uh, to really understand when this uh, state is achieved, when it really has converged, um, we, we can look at some more uh, technical terms here, but I think I will come back to those in, in a bit. So let's first, um, and, and we will use these then to really, really test whether our chain is good, is useful uh, or not. Okay, so let's think about, um, okay, so I should mention, we will use for this transition process to go from one point to the next point, we will use random numbers. We will again use some random proposal and so the, our Markov chain process will be a Monte Carlo algorithm because it uses random numbers. So it's Markov chain Monte Carlo. That's where the name comes from. And MCMC is what I will call it very often. Okay, so let, now let's think about the process of transitioning from one point in our parameter space to another point in our parameter space. This transition um, is often called a transition kernel. So if it's a probabilistic process, you have some probability to go some, to some other point, to some next point, given your current point. And there are many ways of defining this. There are many schemes you can come up with to define such a transition. And each transition kernel is gives basically a new class of MCMC algorithms and they all have names and some are simple and some are complicated and we will talk about some of them. But it's, it's a wide array of fields and at the bottom of this, uh, of this page, you can find a whole list of um, variants of Markov chain Monte Carlo um, and only some of them we will be talking about. <clears throat> we will start simple. Okay, so this one of the simplest ways to make this transition is you uh, say you have locally, you have a Gaussian around your current point and you draw a random new point according to the Gaussian. So you propose, maybe I want to jump here and this is drawn from a normal distribution centered at your current point with some proposal width, some sigma. <clears throat> so you do a Gaussian draw around your current point. And uh, this, this process would be Gaussian random walk Markov chain Monte Carlo. But there's something missing because so far we have not used uh, anything about our target distribution. So let's let's uh, uh, implement this nevertheless in, in code a little bit. So we start our chain at 0, 0. Um, we set our sigma for our proposal. Our previous point, we get it back. That's 0, 0. And we make a normal distribution around our previous point with that sigma. And we get a new point and here it is, proposed point. So we jump a little bit away from zero, zero. 
And now comes the final ingredient. And that is the acceptance rule. Whether we accept this point or we stay with our current point. And the rule, the acceptance rule here is somewhat simple. We check um, the ratio of the proposed points likelihood or target function to our current, where we currently are. So we take the target um, probability ratio and we accept with this ratio. So if that means there are basically three scenarios. So if the the target is, has a higher probability here. So if we go up in our function, then we always accept. If this point is much lower in our function, if, it, if the likelihood or the, the posterior, more specifically, if the posterior is much, has a much lower probability, then we never accept this point. We stay here. But if it's slightly, uh, if, if it's a slightly lower probability here, let's say the probability ratio is three to one, then we accept it probabilistically. So in three out of four, sorry, in one out of three cases, we would then jump there. Or in other words, we accept with the probability alpha, which is the target probability ratio of the current to the proposed point. And this is called the Metropolis algorithm, this, this whole process of proposing and then checking whether we accept or not, and probabilistically accepting. And there is also an extension that is very commonly uh, called, uh, used, uh, at least in words, the Metropolis Hastings algorithm which applies if, so in this case, we had our proposal being a Gaussian. And once we jump here, we would apply the same Gaussian here for our next iteration. And so you see the proposal probability that this would be proposed from this point or that from this point, this one would be proposed is exactly the same, it's symmetric. So the probability to go forward versus backwards is exactly equal. But you might think of cases where you choose a proposal distribution where this is not the case, and then you need a correcting factor, and that's what the hasting extension does. But as long as you use uh, symmetric proposals, you just use the metropolis algorithm. So we have metropolis MCMC with the Gaussian random walk. And here is uh, here your here is a bug. You have to fix this. You have to implement this algorithm. Um, this is just the Metropolis algorithm that is described here, except in some probability that's proportional to the target ratio. And so, if we try to apply this we loop our over some number of iterations that we want. Here we want 10,000 iterations of our chain. We start with our previous point in the chain. We make our proposal. So we propose again a new point. And we think, do we accept this point or not? And if we do, then our next point is this proposed point. And otherwise, our next point is the point where we're currently at. And we add this, whatever we decide here, to the chain. So you see sometimes, or maybe many times, the, some point will get repeated because we will stay there. And that repetition is important because if we make a histogram, then this would be weighted more than, uh, than if we didn't repeat. OK, here is the same written in a function that's just exactly the same code as above here. And you are going to play with this in, in a bit. And 
now if I have this function, I can start at some point and iterate for some number of iteration, set a sigma. And here I'm not just producing one chain, but I'm actually producing four chains. I'm looping here and get four chains. And now we can look how often did that happen? How often did we accept our proposed point? And here it is. It's the number of accepts over the total length of the chain. And our acceptance rates in those four chains were above 90%. So most of the time we jumped. And uh, you can study this a little bit when you vary, when later you're gonna vary these proposals. Um, and uh, generally, if you have very low acceptance rates, that means your proposal is very wide and you, you always propose very far away from your target. And that, that uh, point is very low in the posterior. And because the posterior probability is very low, you never accept there. And so you always stay. You can also say that stay, the chain is stuck. Um, and uh, you're not going anywhere. And on the other hand, what we have right now are these very high acceptance rates, higher than 50%. And that happens when your proposal is very small. You basically meander around in the space. You make very small steps and uh, you're basically walking randomly around because your posterior is changing very, very little. So you're accepting and accepting and you're not really exploring the entire posterior. But anyway, let's look at those chains. And here are a bunch of visualizations. So here I'm just plotting for the first chain, the first parameter versus the second parameter. So here is the first parameter versus the second parameter. And in color is the iteration. So you see it starts somewhere and it's wandering around and wandering around and exploring our banana. So recall uh, up here, this is our banana. We started at our chain at zero, zero, and it's been wandering around somewhere here. Okay. So this is one visualization that's the conditional probability distribution because here is parameter two and parameter one. <clears throat> Now we can also plot iteration versus one parameter. So here is the iteration. We started um, at zero for parameter one, and it's been wandering around, wandering around to here. And we can look at the second parameter. Here's how it walked around. So if, and if you plot, this versus this, you get this plot. And these plots are called trace plots. <clears throat> and what you can see here is that, so for example, our last point is very similar to the previous point and so forth. And these points are very different from these points. So this, this whole process seems to have some memory, some correlation going on some long-term memory of, of where it's been. And you also clearly see that it hasn't really explored all uh, of our parameter space. It's, it's been here and here, but it's not been going up and down our whole banana. Now you can also make histograms of parameter one and parameter two. And uh, at the moment here, I'm plotting just one chain and you can, uh, you, are, you are asked here to plot all four chains that we've produced. At the moment, I would just plot the first one. And here's our uh, histogram of parameter one and parameter two. And uh, you already, you already know that this didn't explore the entire parameter space. So these are probably not very trustworthy, but you might not exactly know that. So um, let me, yeah, okay. 
So what I will do now is look what happens when we run when we run this chain a couple of times. So let me just uh, fill that in. Relatively quickly. Oh, and I think I might have to, I might actually have to run this whole thing. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, because I have to implement this, but if I implement it, then you will see the solution. That's not good. Okay, let me just keep going. Um, okay, because I want to come to this part, which is how do we know whether these uh, plots are good or not? So we already saw from these trace plots that um, this part of the chain is quite different from this part of the chain. So what we could do is we split this chain into a bunch of chunks and we look what this, these histograms of parameter one look like for each of the chunks. And here is exactly that. We split it into four chunks and we look at the histograms of each of the chunks. And you see they are quite different. And that's a sign that we haven't really explored the entire parameter space yet. If we ran this chain for a very long time, then each chunk would have seen probably the entire banana, but this hasn't happened yet. Okay. And now, because I ran four chains that I haven't shown you yet, I've only shown you the first chain, but we can also do this for our four chains. So we split each uh, chain into chunks. And here is, this is plotted. So for parameter one in red is uh, chain one, it's mean and standard deviation. This is chain two, this is chain three, this is chain four. And each chain I've also split into four chunks here. So this is the first 25%, second 25% and so forth for chain four. This is for chain three and so forth. And now we're gonna talk about <clears throat> a method for quantifying whether this whole process, this Markov chain Monte Carlo has approximated our target distribution. So now I will jump back here to this. So here we were wondering if whether the distribution of chain points, does it approximate the target distribution? In that case, we will call the chain converged. And to achieve that, I have to introduce a couple of technical terms and those are stationarity and ergodicity. And I will just use, um, relatively simple analogs uh, for this and some sketches. So <clears throat> uh, stationarity is when you have a random process, but that random process doesn't evolve over time. So it's, it's uh, parameters stay the same. So for example, it's variance, it's mean, um, uh, stay the same over time. So here you have an example of a non-stationary process. Here you have some variance and here um, you might have the same variance, but you see that the mean has changed over time or over its, its evolution. So that would be an example of a non-stationary process. Um, and then I want to talk about ergodicity. And ergodicity, here's, uh, here's an, an analogy. Let's imagine you have some society and you look in the year 2021 um, at your population and you measure the height of all of these people. 
and you get a distribution of height. So you get some babies and some teenagers and some adults and some elderly, and you have some distribution of the heights at this snapshot in time. Okay. And then you pick out one of those people um, and you look at what is, for this one person, what is that person's evolution in that person's height over time? So you look at that person every year, you measure the height and you get them as teenagers, uh, adults, and when they're at old age, and again, you get a height distribution. And now you can ask the question, is this distribution the same as this distribution? And maybe you can think of cases where this is true, but you can easily think of cases where this is not true. So for example, if you had a society that's mostly comp composed of young people or mostly composed of old people, and both of these exist in various nations, then this would not be the case. So you're looking at some distribution at a snapshot of time over many instances versus in one instance over that instance's lifetime. And if they are the same, then you have an ergodic process. And now we can try this out because we have a bunch of instances, we have a bunch of chains, and each of those chains has an evolution over time. And we can go to some snapshot of the chain for uh, chains, for example, the last point of each of the chains. And we can look at the distribution of those points. <clears throat> so let's try to apply this principle to our four chains. And what we would like to see for a good chain is that each of the chunks and all of the means of the entire distributions, all of these crosses and circles should all line up. Because in this case, every chunk, so every um, evolution of, of one instance would be the same as comparing across instances. So let's try this a um, bit more quantitatively. So if we say W are the average of the chunk variances, so how much each chunk varies, that would be the, the width of these black ones. So you take the average width of these black ones and you call it W. Then you take the mean in each chain. So that would be the red points. And you, if you take the average of those red ones, you would uh, get M. And now you compute, compute how much these red points scatter. What's the standard deviation of those red points? Okay, here's just the variance of these M, M I's. And now we're gonna compute this statistic r hat, which is the square root of one plus b over w. And what does that mean? So if all these red ones lined up perfectly, if all the red ones lined up perfectly, um, then the variance of these means would be zero. So b would be zero. And in this ca case, r hat would be exactly one if b is zero. And the w here just helps uh, basically scaling what, what, what is a large value of b and what is a small value of b. And, um, but otherwise doesn't do much. So this r hat tells us how much these red points line up. And so how do we use this? This is, the, uh, this is a diagnostic of our chain. How do we use this diagnostic of our chain? Um, if our hat is one, then we can 
sort of be happy. Um, and if our head is much larger than one, we might think that there's something wrong. Let me uh, try to explain what I said above uh, again with these sketches. Maybe that helps also. So for each chain, we have the variance within the chain. And if we break up into chunk, into chunks, each of these chunks has a mean. And we can compute the variance within this chain using those means. <clears throat> so that quantifies the within chain variance. And we can quantify, so we have one chain, second chain, third chain, fourth chain. We can compute how much these differ. If we take the mean of the first and the second and the third and fourth, how much variance is between those means? And ideally we want this between chain variance to be the same as the within chain variance, or at least, uh, or much smaller ideally. And that's this concept of testing for ergodicity. And if the rule of thumb is, if our hat is larger than 1.01, something like that, that's a sign that the chain has not converged yet. And you might have to run longer your chain has not explored your parameter space well, or you might want to choose a different transition kernel, for example, change the proposal size and so forth. And so here um, it is exactly this implemented. We split the chain into chunks. We compute the chunk variances, the means, and this, so this W and B from the formulas above, and we compute the R hat with the formula and here it is for parameter zero and for parameter one and you see it's not good it's much larger than one so now we've quantitatively found that there's some issue with this chain okay um, that was a lot already so i'm sure there are a bunch of questions so um, I will take um, a bit of time here to take questions. And after the questions, we will take the rest of this morning session for you to play with the exercises, which an exercise one is essentially just playing with this method, uh, seeing how it behaves when you twiddle with it, and getting a feel for how these Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms work. And the first aspect there is to fill in this metropolis rules rule to implement it. Um, so this will be your first task to do that and then to play around with it and see what results you get. So please um, do ask any questions you have Okay, Gabriel, please. Uh, yes, I, I wondered, um, how did you decide on the number of chunks? Because um, naively, it seems to me that having a lower number of chunks changes the ratio between the within chain uh, variance, for example, and the between chain variance. So how does this how does this relate to the number of chunks? Because now you chose four, but is there a particular reason for this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm uh, not entirely sure um, what is the best method here, but um, so what you want is in each chunk you want to get some good measure of its mean. So it can't be just one point, I guess, and you want enough. So that limits how many chunks you want to make. So you probably don't want thousands. And um, on the other hand, you want to have at least a few chunks so you can compute a variance across them. So four is probably quite a low number on that. So maybe more would be better, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, uh, Francesca, do you have uh, a comment on this? Do you, do you have an idea? 
Uh, no, I just agree with what you say. I think most packages that I'm aware of would look at the length of your chains and then choose a sensible or at least minimum um, number of chunks to work with and maybe depending on the package, warn you if your chains are too short or something's wrong. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the same applies to how many chains you should run. Um, so you want a few, so you run around in the parameter space quite a bit, but you probably don't want tens of thousands because then you have a lot of computing effort. <clears throat> okay, more questions? I would have one actually. Yeah. Uh, so uh, concerning the acceptance rate, uh, you mentioned that the ideal uh, uh, percentage would be something around 23%. Can you elaborate on where that number comes from? Right. So um, there is quite a lot of um, theory on Markov chain Monte Carlo. And there's some theoretical analysis for in the limit. So if you run this chain for an infinitely number of iterations, you can make um, very interesting proofs of how quickly this chain will converge or uh, what holds under these circumstances. <clears throat> and there are some derivations. Um, what is the ideal acceptance rate from these theoretical analyses? I don't know the details, to be honest. Um, but um, from that, that's, that's where these, this number comes from. And it holds for, I think, uh, more than three dimensions, if I'm not mistaken. And the number is slightly different if you just have one dimension. Um, but yeah, this is sort of a rule of thumb. This is uh, the ideal process. I mean, if, if it's a little bit above or below, it's probably okay as well. But um, that was at least a theoretical result. And I think I have some resources linked in the in the books and papers, a notebook. So probably you can find a bit more information where this comes from uh, in there. OK, so just conceptually, uh, the idea is to still have it running. You don't want it to be stuck at some point in the parameter space. So even if you extend the number of iterations into uh, well, infinitely, if you will, uh, you still want it to run around, right? So you don't want uh, the acceptance rate with increasing number of iterations to converge towards zero. Um, mm -hmm. But you also don't want to uh, get into the situation of performing this Levi flight of just uh, randomly um, covering uh, the entire parameter space, even uh, with increasing number of iterations. Is that the idea somewhat? Yes, yes. Um, so I think this probably I should write random walk uh, here. It's a bit more technically correct. But yes, so um, you're sort of aiming here for a balance between um, this low number of acceptance rate where you're not going anywhere, so you're not really exploring um, this, this target distribution. So for example, if I was if I was here at zero zero and my proposal would be plot, uh, had had a sigma of ten, I would always propose a far away from this this target, so that would be bad, and I wouldn't go anywhere. And the other situation is where you and that's the situation we are in right now. Um, sorry, I was. Um, Okay. Um, when, when you have a high acceptance rate, so basically you, you're proposing very tiny steps and your, and in these tiny steps, your target function doesn't change much. So your, um, your probability ratio 
between your current point and the next point is essentially one, and you would very frequently accept. But you're not efficiently exploring, you're not really going anywhere. And to get a balance between those two situations, you want to, to aim for something that's in between, and, and that's the idea to, to aim for uh, 25%, where you reject some of the points, so the proposal was too far, but you accept a, a good chunk of your proposal. Okay, and uh, these numbers, uh, they would work for uh, in a very high number of iterations, right? So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so this so is... It, it, it's for the number of iterations that's needed uh, for convergence. And then these would be the numbers that you could use as a rule of thumb. Um, so this, these acceptance rates, this is just a measure of how well your chain is walking around. And it gives you an idea of <clears throat> whether your transition kernel is good or not. It doesn't really directly tell you how many iterations you will need to do, but it gives you a feeling of how efficient your process is. And um, yeah, you will, in the, in the breakouts, you will play around a bit and, and get a feeling for how these chains look and how the acceptance rates change when, you're, when you alter this proposal distributions. Yeah, but but it's scaled or it, it's scaled or normalized or yeah, it's divided by the length of the change. So uh, it depends on the number of iterations. And so at, if you start, for example, at a point that's far away from mm -hmm. your target distribution, you could have uh, a high acceptance rate at first mm -hmm. going towards that target distribution and then once you're inside of that target distribution area mm -hmm. uh, with increasing number of iterations the uh, acceptance rate will go down is that yes that's correct okay okay so you could also Thanks. so here i just accumulate the number of accepts but here you could also every i don't know every hundred iterations you could print out okay in this hundred uh, attempts how many were successful and then you would get for every 100 iterations your acceptance rate so you would get more of a live update of what's going on in your chain here i've only computed for the entire chain but that that could also be very useful to see um, if your chain is, is doing well and if things are changing during what's happening uh, in the chain and you can i think oh uh, yeah so this is something you can also explore. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, I think uh, David was next. Yes, I was wondering um, what happens when you have several local maxima uh, that are separated by a large distance or when there is a large drop in probability between them. Um, is there any way to make sure that you caught all of the uh, local maxima? You just have to repeat it a sufficient number of times different starting locations? Yes, uh, this is a very good question. And uh, in fact, it's such a good question that I made it a homework exercise two, where you put two Gaussians and they are separated by a distance of delta. And um, you, can, you can see, you can try out how well this process works if you put these maxima further and further apart. <clears throat> and um, as you already noticed, um, your proposal distribution might not, if, if you have them, these modes very far apart, it might not be able to jump over from one to the other. Um, you, as you also said, there might be a chance um, to discover that this is the situation if you run it many times, if you have many chains and some happen to run into the first Gaussian and some happen to run into the second um, peak. And then you would know because your between chain variance would be huge. You would be mm -hmm. in this situation actually. 
yeah. or those two would land in one uh, peak and the other two would land yep. in that peak. Yep. So this diagnostic would tell you that this is, that there is a problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is these these multiple modes are a problem for this uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this a problem with dimensionality as well? Then, so if you go to higher dimensions, you just have to do many more iterations of the whole thing to be sure that you caught, uh, let's say, most of the maxima. Um, Good question, and this is also a homework exercise. Um, okay. to study the behavior with dimensionality, how quickly you get to a R hat that is good, and uh, you, you, you can study that. It's of course dependent on the problem you have, but uh, yeah. the scaling is not, not terrible. But it also again mm -hmm. depends on your proposal, and uh, if you use this Gaussian scheme, or there are some other schemes that we can talk about later and actually the afternoon, we will hear about one that works really well for high dimensional problem. And it's different from this one. But this one's easier. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nicolas. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if um, when you define W and B in mm -hmm. the code, if you change notation there. Uh, okay, let's have a look. Um, how do you mean? So because when you define it, um, you say W is the average of the chunk variance, but in the code W is the mean of the chain variance and B is the average of the chunk variance. So did mm -hmm. you switch it or? Yes, that's possible. Let me see here. Chain variances. Uh, yeah, it's possible that it's either wrong in the code or wrong in the description. I have to uh, look at it again. I have the feeling that I did implement it correctly because it behaved the way um, I expected it to. But uh, let me get back to you on that. Um, after the breakout rooms, I, I will have a look right. at what, what, uh, whether the description is wrong or the, the formula is wrong. All right, thanks. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so then uh, I guess you're all keen to start with the exercises, start playing with this thing and uh, see how it behaves. And so we will go into breakout rooms again. Uh, exercise one and two are here for you. Um, ex uh, homework exercise one is a different way of quantifying how uh, well your Markov chain is behaving by measuring the autocorrelation length. So basically here you see there's some mem length of memory. You can measure this with the autocorrelation length and that would be homework exercise one. So that's another way to measure how many effective samples you have by, measure by dividing the total length by that number, by that autocorrelation length then you get an eff uh, effective number of samples. And then you can discuss in the breakout rooms also these questions. And finally, there's again a ticket to leave. This time is very short, it's just three questions. And um, so we will go into breakout rooms now and uh, you, you will be in the breakout rooms until the end of this morning session. And then we will pick it up again in the afternoon with more advanced 
MCMC methods, in particular this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is notebook number five. Okay. So let me... um, Johannes, before we split up, mm -hmm. uh, is there a chance to reach you or Francesca while we're no. in the rooms? If while we have any rooms? conceptual questions. Uh, okay, so the low tech way, I guess, is you send me an email. And otherwise, I'm not sure if you can reach out. I think I made you co host now. So maybe you can jump out into the common room and, and fetch me. Would, would that be okay? I think yesterday it worked. So if you leave the breakout, you go to the main room. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if you guys stay in there, then. That's fine. But also, uh, we can agree that Johannes uh, at least once enter, visit every breakout, and uh, if there are some urgent questions, can answer. The Benedict, did you mean that? Uh, yeah, just wondering if there's any chance, if there should be any questions that I cannot answer, mm -hmm. that I can reach you guys. I think the chat still works, or am I wrong? I think it's also just breakout room chat. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I can um, visit all the rooms towards the end of the hour and let's see if there are any uh, questions remaining. Okay. Okay, good. Then I will create breakout rooms. I'm not entirely sure whether it will assign uh, everyone to the same rooms, but we'll see.